these questions come from uh, a reading of your book, The Transmission of Mission? I'd like to ask first, what is the mission? <clears throat> mission might be considered the fruit or the goal, right? The mission, purpose. And that's different for everyone. Not too many people know that they have a mission. See, in this sense, transmission of mission is not about what you think is your mission. It's not even about the direction you are going in, in terms of your life direction, or anything that is already more or less in motion. So it may not be your mission. Where you're going may not be your mission. Where you've come from may not be your mission. Who you are may not be your mission either, at this point. See, so that's why it's a very profound consideration to know what that transmission is, in terms of the mission, what that could be. It means, what is, what is the communication, and to what purpose, exactly, at what level is such a communication intended to be some kind of mission as such, say, or ultimate purpose. So that becomes more mission as ultimate purpose. What is the individual's ultimate purpose? Good question. Uh, you talk a lot early on in this book about the cultivation of spiritual thoughts or concepts. Uh, can you discuss this idea of cultivation of spirituality and how it applies to daily life? Spiritual practice is about being in the presence of the master. That means being in the presence of peace, being in the presence of clarity, being in the presence of beauty, and feeling that very deeply, being in the presence of no confusion, being in the presence of no doubt, no uncertainty, no division, no separation. All of these things are what spiritual practice is about, left to the individual. However, in the master's company, become very, very clear, because the idea then is to be in some form of peaceful radiation relative to all life. And that you need the Master's Company to be able to set the tone for you. Yeah. Otherwise you are thinking about it, you are imagining what it could be, but in the Master's Company you feel it's very tangible. Yeah. So spiritual practice should be based upon that, primarily. And then whatever it is that spiritual practice is about will be directly revealed to the individual through that agency of teacher the student relationship. And the mentoring process is superior to all other agencies, in the beginning at least. So how do we cultivate or grow this spirituality uh, when we're not in the presence of the Master, let's say in well, between it, times seeing him? So. The, the conventional terminology is you cultivate as if you, you're doing something about it. It cultivates you. Cultivates you. So once you're in the company of the teacher or the master, or in the right company, however you want to look at it, or let's say even better, more uh, uh, in the spirit of love, let's say once you're touched by love, then it has a kind of burning influence. And it's not like you're doing anything about it except you're stuck with the remembrance of it, the, the perception of it, the burn of it. I don't mean a painful, bad encounter with love, I mean real love, which is just an infinite opening, right? An infinite healing. So it cultivates you, but for conventional purposes we can say that you practice, when in fact you, you're being practiced. We can say that you are purifying, when in fact that you are being purified. We can say that you are uplifting, when in fact you're being uplifted. We can say that you r realize or understand, when in fact you're being understood and realized, and so on. You understand the paradox. So you appear to be doing the cultivation, but the more time you spend in the Master's company, or in, the, in the presence of the Word, the teaching Word, and what is calling you from within to do relative to spirituality, then that is cultivating you. The cultivation is a kind of a mutual cooperation of forces, realities, where self melts into other, other melts into self, they both disappear. And what you have left is the heart of the Master itself, or peacefulness, complete, total, perfect heartfulness. Does this process of cultivation put us in conflict in our, let's say, daily lives, and if so, how do we address that? It doesn't put anyone in conflict with anything. You're already in conflict, otherwise you wouldn't be considering these kinds of things as an alternative or a step towards some deeper realization. Conflict is the existing condition, the perception of unhappiness or suffering already overwhelming you, and thus your intuition tells you that uh, 
you're supposed to be happy, you're supposed to be freer, you're supposed to be more complete, right? Potentially you're supposed to be perfect and feeling great all the time, not going through the moody blues of life, right? And so uh, there's no conflict with it at all as far as, you know, the outer world because it's something that you turn on within and then everything is seen from that. So there's no conflict with anything or anybody once you are engaged properly in this particular connection, see, this particular kind of configuration or alignment, then switches on inside and everything follows that, basically. Like in the old school, you know, the old test, uh, the school testaments, the biblical teachings, it's saying, be still and know I am God. That means be into peace and know that this is the divine. Everything else follows that, which is, I think, a very good Good point of view. So again, it's yielding from the inside out and letting, letting the Master Consciousness reveal itself to you as the perfection it is, which is your true I Am. Your true I Am is the Master Consciousness. Uh, you discuss infinite potential uh, in this text, which is a somewhat familiar term, but can you offer your definition? Of infinite potential? Yes. Well, infinite potential is very clearly, absolutely, infinite potential. So that means uh, inconceivable potential. Yeah? Resources that are without any bounds. Yeah? That means you can be the universe as much as you can be a small-minded fool. In fact, both are quite uh, co-existing. Huh? Small-minded fool, who is the universe. The universe is a small-minded fool. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, you, you uh, to quote, say, vibration is the supreme cosmic matrix. Uh, can you elaborate on that? What does it sound like to you that it's being talked about? Is it the matrix? Is it the cosmic or vibration that's being talked about? Well, I think it's vibration. That's what? Everything, essentially. Mm -hmm. Could uh, correspond to uh, something that is uh, relevant to the terminology of a living being, vibrating, life pulse, impulse. Yes. All of it is right? fire, yes, for sure. And uh, that is, that is the, sense, the, the essence of it. <clears throat> Some would say, well, was there an original or primordial basic First vibration, we can say perhaps, yeah, with all due respect to what's going on. Maybe there was, maybe there wasn't. Maybe there's just vibration. We can just yield to that possibility that there is just an ocean, infinite ocean of vibration, and we are part of that. But that's not all we are. Again, if we are part of that, that is the, the we perceiving itself as that. And as long as there is this, we, I, it, other, self and other, then we have to get beyond that completely. So we are the vibration, that is no vibration. Next point. Uh, the second chapter of this book is entitled Create Thought. Uh, in that chapter you talk about the power of thought. Uh, would you say that we are what we think or as we think? You are what you are. Beyond self, thought and mind. The question is, what is it that you are? See? And that is uh, perhaps the paradox, that you are what you are not, which is good. You are not being what you truly are, which is another good one. You see? These are different perspectives, again, relative to what? Levels of consciousness of perception. But again, furthermore, reducing everything to what you are and what you aren't is for the beginning stage. See? Because you are neither this or that. Everything is relative to your perception level of consciousness, state of unfoldment or rate of vibration, and that's for the beginning. In order to really fulfill the obligation of what your mission is, the transmission relative to your mission is to be at the end, which means without beginning or end, okay? so that there is also no self, no other, and collapse the whole thing of what is called self, thought and mind into the moment, okay? that there is no self, there is no time, there is nothing but itself. Peace. Pure, absolute, clear, abiding peace. Everything else is more or less measured over and against that relative to the programs of the individual. But what is it doing? It's trying to 
open its, itself more and more to its true nature or the heart nature which is peacefulness as it is peacefulness simply as it is always as it is is this a process of going from being used by thought to cultivating and using thought as we wish well thought is a thought thought is a projection of let us say a concept it's a concept so it's a reference thought everything is thought this is thought and so since everything is thought then we know that there's also no thought uh, because everything that is thought is an appearance we can perceive it so we know that everything that is thought as an appearance is veiling what it really is which is not what it appears to be which is no thought so no thought is part of this particular uh, transmission of mission but it's not merely no thought as opposed to thought as an appearance and then we have non-appearance or disappearance and we're talking about a thought that is beyond thought and no thought, okay, which may not be a thought at all. Think about it. Or don't think about it. <laughs> uh, you state in this book, the master who has come to save the world is not at all interested in any world or saving it. Can you explain that? Well, the master who has come to save the world has already saved the world. <clears throat> Everyone else is pretending to not be that, let us say. We've already saved the world. We've already destroyed it. The world is not the world. And this is basically just the mind playing against itself or playing with itself to make a point, whatever that point is. That would be ultimately that it is stuck in thought programs, self-imagery. So the master, of course, is not part of the world. So it's saying, well, you know, the, the next person you see or the next Buddha you see, kill it. So, what we're talking about is killing your projections. And if there is such a master, why would it be concerned about doing anything with this world? If it was a master, it would understand what the world was, and as such, it would let the, it would let the world be. <coughs> so you have to save yourself by dropping out of yourself completely. In so doing, then you become master of self, if you can do that. And as such, then you're saving yourself. You're saving yourself from your own world of programs. So these are very good, very useful points of view that have to be taken to their absurd level in order for a deeper comprehension as to what the mystery of appearance relative to disappearance or reappearance is all about. Because we're here to appear, to disappear. You're born to be here for a moment and you're gone. Then it's like, what were you? Who are you? Where'd you go? Okay. So this is, this is a kind of paradoxical, magical, strange world of illusion or maya. Everybody's here for a moment and they're gone. You're here for a visit, and you're gone. Where are you? Where did anybody else go? You understand? So this is all about appearance and disappearance, which is kind of like an interesting reality to be a part of. Okay. What's real? Is the appearance real or the disappearance real? Or maybe neither are real. Okay. Nothing is real. Yeah. And, but you have to know what the nothing is. And that nothing is a very profound something. You have to know what it is in order to get to the point. Right. What is the nothing? But nobody is. That is the real. Right. Everything. The real of everything. Everything and nothing. The everything of nothing and the nothing of everything. All the same. So then what is it that uh, motivates or moves the Master to save the world that he's not interested in? What is the source of that? Well, that, that is obviously a point that is for the seeker. All of these kinds of ideas help the seeker understand the true nature of the master, which is to be free of the world, completely. They're completely free of the world. There is no world. The master then is a metaphor for that which is not the world. Okay. So yet, that plays against everybody's idea of what a master is as a superman or as a hero, which is also what it is, but it's beyond that too. It's not interested in your bullshit. It's not interested in your programs. It's not interested in saving you uh, when you are responsible. You should be interested in saving you by watching what you do that causes you suffering because the only thing to be safe from is suffering as far as that goes and then uh, you reach a point where you see there's no suffering at all except by way of a projection and based upon a certain kind of perversion of identification relative to self and other and so on and so forth and so once you start to reconcile all these things in terms of what your real functional mission is here which is to transcend that means to be a part of but not a certain unconscious part of the processes of 
the universe in terms of time, space, energy, and matter relative to the stages of the, you know, the physical, the astral emotions, or some would say the so-called uh, gravitational forces, right, of the subtle bodies, and so on. Well, these are very real dimensions of consciousness. Yeah. We are not that as well, but we have to align everything together so that we become a true, and whole, complete, perfectly operating, uh, selfless, peaceful being. Right? And maybe someone says Buddha nature, or maybe it's, as we would say, Huda nature here. Yeah. Would you say that transcendence is simply disinterest, or? Transcendence is beyond transcendence, so it couldn't be disinterest. <laughs> I'd like to ask you about the I am statement. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. can, can you elaborate? Which I am statement do you uh, have, if you want to uh, Well, for example, uh, you say, the I, the I am is the bridge to opening and closing consciousness awareness in accordance with or defiance of the law of spirit. Yes. Okay, that's what is useful in the beginning, since I am not suffering. I am more than just being a victim, I am victorious. So you're flipping the switch, you're reversing the order of things to help yourself out. Try to balance this uh, particular dilemma of being victim in the universe. I am a woman. You have to know that you're, I am not a woman, right? Or not only a woman, right? I'm also not a man, that's just as bad. Right? So then what is the I am that it needs to be? So I'm beyond a man or woman. So okay, we can use that. I'm beyond humanity. So good. We do. I am spirit. Ah, then maybe your view is starting to open up. So that can help. Your view then becomes a force unto itself that starts to recreate karma. Because if it's your view, that means it's an extreme form. It is a structure. As a structure, it is subject to electromagnetic flux. That structure becomes a magnet. Huh? Hmm. So we use our I am statement to attract or... No, we, we, you know, not to attract. Just by changing your thought, it happens by itself. It's not something you do, and that's the problem with it, because as soon as you start to go to a movie or hear the media, uh, that thought stays in you, and that's already attracting and trying to build karma in you. Say, so, oh, there's war. You're, you're stuck on the war theme, and you are in the state of war. You're creating the war in your mind, and you're bringing the war to the peeps in your neighborhood. You're bringing the war to your peeps at home. Say, I just saw the news, I feel like hell, because I've been seeing the war. I am the war. <laughs> I am is the war in that case, eh? So it's not even what you're doing, it's what you're subjecting yourself to, to having done, being done to you, see? It's being done, it's not even what you're having done to you, it's being done to you anyway, see? So you're being created. So you have to then try to, in understanding the fact that you are either being created or recreated according to someone else's programs or agenda, in this case the society in general, uh, then you want to be able to practice so that you are creating something that is more characteristically and uh, beneficially uh, yours. True to your peace needs, true to your enlightenment needs or your heart needs as such. So you put it out there. Just because you say you're not the world doesn't necessarily mean that the world isn't having its impact on you. So you can say it, but it's not that you believe it. It's not that you've allowed it to work for you to any degree. See, so these are, these are things that have to do with thought, thought as force that can either serve to reinforce your dilemma and your predicament in the time-space world as a seeker or as a human, or it can empower your situation, for better and for worse, make your ego worse, heavier, more overblown, right, and a problem, or it could make you too humble and thus be crushed under the weight and gravity of, you know, the heavier levels of the species that are operating and running the world today. You go out there and get hit by a Mack truck, come here, unnecessarily, see. So we have to be very clear, that's why mentoring is so important, so that all of these various but very, very many complex, subtle uh, bits of data having to do with gnosis and true knowing are really important to uh, use properly as you're transitioning from your karmic state of self-created ignorance 
to your intended state of selfless understanding and wisdom, which takes, takes time. But you have to understand the workings of the mind, but then even if you have all the instruments like these particular devices that are really are offered in these books, particularly in the transmission of mission, which are very great contemplative techniques, they're not going to work the same with everybody because not everybody has the same kind of self-image, has the same kind of self-basis or self-background. And so this, these things need to be explored more properly and carefully. Not everyone has a creative view. Not everyone has a creative intelligence karma. So if you're having more suffering working behind you, you have to start to correct that and adjust that as much as possible because no matter what kind of good idea you, you can decode your real phenomena, emotionally speaking with, uh, then those emotions are going to win out. That's why a lot of people want to win the lotto and they can't win the lotto because they've got karmas that are the contrary. They stand as a contrary, not because they're not good enough or they're not praying enough or not having enough love or whatever. They don't have the right karma to link them to that. And so, it doesn't happen. And so can something like the I am statement be used to change karma? Uh, the I am creates karma, so of course it can change karma, because that's all creating karma, continues to create karma. Now what karma? Again, it depends on your recognition of the real gravity of your tendencies. The programs that are negative, that means are formed as a payment for you, you have to recognize what these are. So it's good to know where your peeps are, what your peeps are, what is coming through your peeps, and know what your ancestry is about. Because there's some peeps out here with very dark ancestry and they'd rather not talk about it, yet that ancestry, as a force in terms of the river blood, has a lot to do with what they can do or can't do. Has a lot to do with how they feel about themselves and what they play or how they play or why they can't play this and why it's impossible for them to establish this kind of relationship or this kind of business or this kind of position. All of these things are actually on the surface of what is going on underneath. That's why it's good to come to a certain uh, mentoring level of consciousness where all of these things can more or less be vented, properly seen, properly recognized, and then properly put to rest in due time. Can these types of karmas, family karmas, be uh, transcended while they're still present, or do they have to be... Well, they are, they've already been transcended, so they are present, but they're also transcended. It depends on what level of practice you're able to achieve in your lifetime, like even now, you know, right now. What level of practice are you able to achieve right now? which functions as an overriding of those karmas. You can do it for a few moments and really get out of your body and out of your mind for a few moments and that might be helpful because you create a gap. You may be able to take a leap into a deeper consciousness. That's part of it. The idea, of course, is to stay in the deeper consciousness as much as possible. That's really what it's all about. Transcend the karma completely, not just visit every, every occasion again. You know, a deeper place as a sort of kind of vacation or a refuge, you know, some sort. You, you are being it. You have to know that this is what you're being, but you're not in touch with. You're in touch with the conditional karmas that run your life, making you think you're you, making you think you feel what you feel, and that you look the way you look, and that you, you walk the way you walk, and you feel the way you feel as a, as a being, as a relative, as a boyfriend, girlfriend, as a working cooperative, as a business person. All of that is part of your programming. That's using you. You're not always using it to the degree that you have to be using it. So, so it uses you until you come to terms with it. You have to reach the threshold of identity, a cr very critical threshold where you say, no, I want to take back. I want to be in charge of all of this. Uh, you can do that as an ego, and then you have certain success levels there, but then if you do it as a spirit, going beyond the ego completely, then you have a much better disposition afterwards, because then everything is used by the heart, if you can get to what the heart is. Then as many spiritual uh, traditions would uh, have very much evidence to, uh, to corroborate, then you reach a certain selfless state of consciousness. And then it's not like you are less, you're more. You say you're much more, you have more power, but it's not ego power, so you don't use it against anybody, you don't manipulate other people. It's heart power. Yeah? People who around you might sense that it's really heart power, it's love power, not uh, manipulation. It's just love power. It's not a control program, like many other people who are powerful because of their egos. Right, who know they can change these karmas and they, they try their darndest to override these karmas so that they can gain advantage. That's one way of doing it. The other way is to go a more humble route, uh, the creative route, understanding certain laws of creation and getting into that and 
using that to get to a certain level of consciousness where you are starting to revolutionize your karmic situation so that it starts to work for you in a positive sense. And how do we know we've revolutionized our karmic situation? What do well, we you would know that immediately because you know when you start feeling good. Not feeling good because you're killing people, you start feeling good because your heart is growing. Your heart is growing and you know and you see love coming back to you. See, this is about love in a certain way. It's not about just power for power's sake and, you know, revolution in terms of a negative political movement against another one to bring it down so that one is better than the other. No, we have to get beyond this kind of thing, although this is the way of the world at the same time. See, we have to understand that the heart needs to be put back in place and in control of the universe. And each has to do it in their own way, immediately, by recognizing what the heart is and what the self is and which one is better, which is greater, which is more you know, the hippo one to have uh, as your basis, right? Right? Stingy ego, a beautiful blossoming heart vibe, right? Going out to everybody, right? Healing, right? You can either stink or you can heal. It's up to you. It's your choice. <laughs> uh, some of your language in this book is very simple. Uh, for example, you say, it is better to be spiritual, so always be spiritual. So my question is, is spirituality a simple subject? Uh, Absolutely, for some. Confusing? Well, maybe for you it's complicated, maybe for you it's simple. But for some, see, because everyone is, with the beauty of it is that everyone is in a different world within themselves. As a body or in the river of blood, you have one, one Pete who has a brother or sister who's same family, same house, maybe even the same room, but they have a totally different disposition, a totally radically different sense of good feeling, sense of love, sense of worth and value, all of this, it's very clear. And so we're talking about then, somebody in that same family, could be seven or eight peeps at the dinner table, and then the word spiritual comes up and then they have an experience of it. Yet everybody else might just be thinking about it or just brushing it off like, oh, who needs that, that's too weak. Oh, those are those, those weep, weep, weepy, weak peeps. Uh, you sneeze, and you blow them out, out, out of the neighborhood, right? It's so weak, right? <laughs> uh, that's not the, what we're talking about. Spiritual is transcendent. So, transcendent. That's why it's better to be that. Always be that. And for those who are ready for that message, then they get it. It's like they're being, getting hit by a Mack truck, right? When they're ready for it, they're, whoa, and they get it. And they move right into it. So all it takes is that. But others will, will take years to figure that out. Something as, as you said, simple as that and yet as inaccessible as that, when it's absolutely simple as that is, and true and as powerful as that could be and ought to be for some people. Um, you say there is only perfection in spirit, and also spiritual perfection is always here now. So how can we better understand and recognize perfection, and does pursuit of perfection in the material world help or hinder our spiritual growth? Pursuit? part of the process. Opening is the real part of the process. Perfection is always here. It's, no, it's nowhere else but in here, right now, with us. You are the perfection you, you aspire to become perfectly realized as in the future. You are the master you're, you're here to become that you've been pretending not to be all your life. It's already you. But it's not developed in the sense, and operational in the sense that it could be, under the right circumstances where all your forces come together, all your calmness come together in a point which, which points to you and you see everywhere reflected that you are the master. That comes in time. It won't come out first because of your doubts and your other, your massive self-imagery to the contrary. But you are the victim and you are this, you are this guy, you are that girl, and so on. All of that has to be burned in the wisdom see, that uh, there's more than your appearance. That there's more than yourself, your thought patterns, and your so-called ever-changing mind. There's much more than that. There's the heart. Where's the heart in all of this? See, that's it's already perfect. That's the perfection we need to recognize and open to and then realize on the spot. See, that is the perfection. Cultivating means just paying attention to that. See, being with it. Feeling it. So does pursuit of uh, perfection or attainment in the material world, is, is that a limitation? Or? It's an opening. It is an appropriate opening. See, it's just like when the sun comes out, the flower opens. It responds to the light. It's not that it's pursuing it, it's just a natural response. It's a natural opening. 
See, so the flower is not pursuing the sun, the sun is not pursuing the flower. So we have to understand the nature of things. See, the beingness of everything. When the master shows up, then it's time to open. If you can, if you can, then you, you don't. And that's your natural thing to do, not to open. But it's good, good to open. You're not opening to the master as a person, you're opening to the master as an influence of presence. So you can open to the person too, but you can open beyond that into real presence, which is a function of spirit bringing a master or anything like that to your company. So you see how other than yourself you can be. See? And so then it's a matter of opening in all cases. Pursuit is not a bad idea. Being aware of something and wanting to get closer to it, all of this is is academically related to the whole thing. You need to get closer to it. You want to find out whatever theories there are about the thing you're looking to, to become or get into, to make sure it's safe for you and all that. But you know, it's one way of getting to it, you know, theoretically getting to it, or you can have a heartfelt uh, impression or impulse and just know what it is, and then you, you know you just have to wait for what it is by yielding to what it is and letting it happen, like the flower opening. It's not a mental process, it just naturally opens to the light and it receives it. It's done. It's not a negotiation. It's natural. Natural law. Sometimes that can happen at a word. You can hear a note on an instrument, see a look, see a picture, hear a sound, right? see anything. And you, you start. And you start this process. That means it's a light point. You reach a point of light, it's an intersection in your time-space world, right? a very critical, crucial crossway, and then this happens. You start to feel the light. There's nothing you can do about it, and there's nothing that anybody can do about it once you get to that point, because that's what you do, because that's what you are at that point in opening. Everything else is theoretically this, that, or whatever, and maybe relatively valid to one person over another. But when you get to the point, then you see it's time to stop, time to open, and receive the grace. And would you say that this leads to recognition of, let's say, the perfection of our own non-perfection? Yes, the perfection of your non-perfection or your imperfection is all part of it. You need to know what imperfection is if you're going to know what perfection is. If you know what perfection is, then you know what imperfection is, absolutely. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question on health. Uh, you make this comment in the transmission of mission. The perception of illness is created of the habit of not knowing the real field of spirit as spirit. True health is the knowing of spirit as spirit. Illness is not only a condition of health or condition of the self, mind, or body. Illness is a created and thus recreatable view or contraction of psychic force that can make or break spirit's flow possible or perfect. Yes. With, with that as a basis, can you comment on uh, people's spiritual outlook and health and how they uh, interact? Uh, we'll go right back to the former image. It's opening. Reading that point. Reaching that point where the light is present and you just open. The opening is a healing. It's all, it's all, all at once. Huh? It's a healing. And it takes you beyond your thought, it takes you beyond your world, because it's a healing. Your, your conditions may remain the same. Because the healing then has to be a soul, a soul level of healing. That means your awareness must be healed, not so much your karmas. Okay. So once your awareness is healed, this is good for handicapped people and other people who have catastrophic injuries or catastrophic conditions. Once you are touched by the soul and the spirit, that heals you and then you're okay with everything. It can happen in combat. It's happened many times in combat to my friends and others. All of a sudden, you know, they hear they hear a piece of shrapnel hit another piece of metal, and then they, they have an awakening. They just start to open, and they start to feel peace right at that moment. They don't know why, but that's the cue. That's the key. That they are in peace, and there's war, combat, bloodshed, mangled bodies flying all over the place. But everything seems to stop, and they have this awakening. That they're not this theater, this drama, and so they start to feel beyond that. They start to say, well, I'm more than that. There's another dimension coming into this. Well, that dimension that's coming into it, it's always been there. It's your spiritual dimension. You're having somewhat of a spiritual awakening, but when I was in the military, I had these kinds of things to prove my point. It can happen and sometimes can't happen unless you're in the military because of the pressures that are imposed upon you there. They're extraordinary. And so it's under extraordinary pressures that certain things became very real to me, obvious to me, evident to me. 
and it may happen like that to other people. So your world, circumstances, individuals, is very, very high pressured, so you can have a, a certain kind of opening at any point, depending on how open you are. To begin with, to the possibility of going beyond and being beyond your particular self-created karmic situation. So the individuals who had these experiences, would you say they were uh, still participating in the, uh, let's say, theater of war, but without attachment? Uh, no, then they were no longer participating in the theater of war. With the awakening, then they just stop. They stop. They're done. And they can walk away from it. That's it. They're done. They can walk away. They can maybe go back, but I mean, they're, they're, they're no longer qualified for the same kind of attitude and behavior at that point. It's an awakening. It's a reversal. Things reverse from that point on. It's a miraculous reversal. Where you're going forward, you think you're one person, and then all of a sudden, this thing happens, this moment arises, and that's not you at all. You awaken beyond. It's like you awaken into another dimension. So your karmas remain the same, but your relationship to the karmas is radically altered for the rest of your time. It's in a moment of awakening. It's a crisis. And you don't understand what's going on. You say, oh, what, what happened? Did I give up? Have I failed? I... Everything's happened. You've succeeded, you've failed, you've, you've died, you've been born, reborn, you went to heaven, went to hell. Everything in a, in a split second, all at once, right? Kind of awakening crisis, right? But then you're, you're a different being afterwards. Everything is different after that. Same with the dream. You can have a dream and all of a sudden come back from the dream totally transformed. Transformed. You, you go into the dream one person, you come out a different person. These things have also happened in this case. I've had these kinds of experiences as well, so I know they're common, and they're part of the spiritual process of the burn-off. The burn-off of karma, the burn-off of illusion, the burn-off of mechanical forms and layers of self-thought and mind. All of this stuff is burnable, it's all fuel. Right? Every single thing that goes through your head is fuel for it. Every impression you have is fuel for it. It's wood for the fire, it has to be burned. You cling to it, so you recycle a lot of your clingingness, and you stay in this particular state without transformation until you, you're able to start to recognize that what you're given, what you're being, has to be sacrificed into the fire so that you're a participant in a much more dynamic, much more profound transformational, purificational process as such, or the burn as I would like to call it, putting it into one word, the burn, right, the divine or sacred burn itself. Right? Uh, can you explain the comment, no change is freedom, no changes of karma or changes of state are freedom. No condition is freedom. Freedom is the no condition. Yes, seems pretty clear to me. What are you having a problem with? No change. Right. Now, that depends upon your, your level of identification. Okay. So a change of state, a change of residence, a change of face, right? change of character, that's not freedom. No change is freedom. Freedom is no change. Exactly. Go ahead. It, it, it's a hard Absolutely. concept to grasp. Even it, it's intuitively don't, real. Don't to try. Me. Don't try to grasp it. See, then then it becomes obvious to you what it is. And it's it's not a trying to grasp anything because there's nothing there to grasp. Because if it's true, then it just is, and you get it. You say yes, this is so. That opens you up even more on the inside. Because trying to grasp, trying to use your head, sometimes is a shutting down of what we're talking about. It's an obstruction to the process of yielding and letting be. It's not to be figured out. It's not figuring it out. Remember, when the light is on the flower, there's no negotiation. It's just an opening. I mean, we can listen very closely and attentively, you know, attentively and see if it's saying anything, if it's protesting. I'm being mounted by the sun. <laughs> I'm being forced to open against my will. We don't know if it's going that far. See? See? It's being toasted. It's being forced. Oh, we won't go that far at this point. It's possible. You know you can't get too close to the sun. <laughs> it will burn you. Thank heavens. Go ahead. Another quote from this book. All relations other than with spirit are created of time, space, energy, and matter and are governed by the laws and processes of the material world of nature or cosmic forces. You follow that by saying that spirit is no cosmic force. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain further on that? What is your real question? Spirit means immaterial, it means non-universal in a sense. That's its purpose. Its function as a word is the void. No word. Spirit means the no vo word, the no thing. Spirit, that means immaterial, that means non-existing. 
but a presence, maybe at best a certain kind of presence. And so if it's spirit, which we would then say is source is the finest, subtlest substance or essence of life, then it would be more or less the cause, very possibly logically speaking, theoretically speaking, the cause of forces, the creator of forces, and not equal to or subject to the forces. It is the source of forces, and thus superior to the forces themselves. So this whole thing is what we can say is up to spirit. That, that which allowed these things to manifest, in terms of the forms that they're in, and the cycles they're in, the process that they're engaged in, and the forms that they've taken in terms of universal or galactic, galactic uh, sort of uh, difference. One galaxy different from the other. They're all layers, so they're all complementary and they're all interwoven, they're all intermeshed, they're all interrelated, and they're all also non-existing. Are the words spirit and God interchangeable? Could be. Nothing. Spirit is nothing. Right. That's the no. The ultimate no, which is not a no. It's the, the ultimate no is, is the only yes there is. I mean, people use God to describe a, a being as such, but you're saying something much more profound beyond being. Well, it's probably the being of no being. And from that place, everything is in order, everything is perfect. And there's still potential here. That means this is not a done deal yet. It's a, it's a deal that's being done. <laughs> so I'm going negotiation. Each one of us is negotiating our, our deal with, with it by virtue of what we allow ourselves to be in the moment. Or what we don't allow ourselves to be. It's kind of like then, then it's the flower re refusing to open. <laughs> <laughs> or thus be fed by the light. So, right. uh, you say, in the beginning, know the power of your word. What is the power of one's word? That means the effect, uh, the effect consequence of your word. That's the power of your word. Know the consequences of your speech. Know what creates bad karma, know what creates good karma. By what part of the body right, is expressing itself through your mouth. Whether it's your ass, whether it's your balls, whether it's your navel, whether it's your chest, your heart whether it's your throat, whether it's your fist, whether it's your foot, right? Whether it's your, your head, your eyes, your ears, right? Your brain, your anger, right? All of this. You have to know what's coming through your speech. What part of your body and at what level is your speech being used to create what? Say, so then we're being responsible. That's what practice is about, slowing you down so that you start to see the fine line between what is happening outside and what you're creating by way of your speech, by your word, yeah. by your children of speech, by what is born of your mouth. So the old saying is not what goes into your mouth that will defy you, it's what comes out of your mouth that will defy you. In this case, it's truism. Continue. And so is there a power in just using, let's say, positive aphorisms and positive statements? In relatively the... speaking. Relatively speaking, yes. Depends then not only on what you're saying in terms of your, your interpretation of what is power or positive is, but the, the attitude that goes along with it. Okay? There's then the quality of selfishness or the quality, which is closeness, and the quality of selflessness, which is more openness. And then that brings a flavor of either positive or less than positive. Go ahead. So, uh do the words have an absolute val uh, value to them, or is it the intent? Uh, let's say somebody's using a word incorrectly, but their intent is one thing. Is, is that what's manifested, or, you know? Could be. It could be. Could be more than that. Could be less than that. You have to pay attention. You have to pay attention to all the nuances of your speech, your feelings, your mood, right? The vibrations that uh, accompany it, right? And exactly what's going on. You're hesitation, right? your qualities, right? your manipulation of the impulse or whatever, or you're surrendering to the impulse. You speak from that, openness. Right? Go on. And, and what is the power of the words in terms of the person they're directed to? Is it a matter of their openness to it? Or? 
They don't have to be open to receive anything because everyone is receiving everything without being open to it. When you go to sleep, you're not open to what comes to you, but you're receiving everything when you go to sleep as well. And then you deal with it from the inside, in terms of your dream world or the astral plane and all the rest of that. So you're being impacted, you're being attacked on the astral plane all the time. And, and being complimented and being exalted, depending on what dream you're having, where, with whom, and under what conditions. So we're living in a multi-dimensional universe, so we have to start paying attention to the different areas of life that we exist in and that we're operating on so that we know why certain things are happening for us and why certain things are happening against us. And once we have a better, more complete view of uh, our operations, then uh, we understand even more clearly why certain things show up the way they do, when they do, how they do, under the circumstances that they do, to include the whom these situations uh, show up involving. And so if one is being attacked with words... Uh, you can feel it. You can feel it. Often you may not be feeling anything but good, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you have a bad thought or a bad feeling. That may not just come from you. You may be receiving that from someone. You're saying it may be related to something most recently, some, uh, a person that saw you, thought you were someone else, and said, oh, there's that piece of garbage over there. It's just walking there. Oh, he looks a little different, but that's that piece of garbage. And poor you, who are not that guy, you know, take the rap. You're targeted. Right? It's like a bazooka goes off and you get hit in the butt with it. <laughs> RPG. <laughs> Bam! Oh, why did I just feel bad? Something hit me. I don't know. Why am I in a bad mood today? You see? So we don't know because we're closed. We don't feel it. We don't walk we don't walk down the street with a with a certain kind of three hundred and sixty degree attitude. And we walk down the street like eh? Me, 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 going to do what I got to do, and boom, 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 boom. It's all about me, 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 me. And you don't really have any attunement with all that's going on around you. So the tunnel vision there does not serve the purpose of accomplishing the psychic requirements and the subtle requirements of your say, movement through the time-space worlds. So once you're open to that, let's say from the point of view of practice and meditation, where you want to know all that there is to know, as much as you want to know, and you're in that kind of resonance with your consciousness and using your consciousness in that particular 360 degree, all angles, all directions kind of awareness, then you start to learn more about what it is that you're capable of being aware of as you proceed through your world, this world, on your so-called mission. Go on. And so how, how do we defend ourselves then if, if uh, verbally attacked or psychically attacked? Well, the important thing in terms of spiritual practice is to maintain a very positive sense of being. You've got to pull yourself out of the negative. Once you pull yourself out of the negative, it's like bringing yourself up outside of the range, outside of the range of the fire, pulling yourself above the field of fire. Okay. You can't do that if you feel that you are the field of fire and that you are the ego that is the target for the field of fire. Once you start realizing that your, your potential is infinite, so you could be maybe on another galaxy right now, in another galaxy, on some kind of uh, far distant, unimaginable planet. You could be right there right now, in this second. Your awareness and your link could be right there, where you came from. Yeah. And being with that right there might save you, because you're uh, believing you're a target here in this dimension. You're, you've already created yourself as a target in this dimension, physically, because you're here. But your consciousness, just like in the case of the battlefield, you know, when you're, you're, you're in a position where you're being strafed by bullets here, there, and everywhere, from uh, the sky, from the land, and all that, but then you might find a certain place in you that is not part of that. So I feel really good right now. And that goodness, which is not being hit by a bullet, might want to maintain itself. It depends on your level of practice. Say, no, I'm going to feel good today no matter what happens. And that, that could possibly keep you away from the field of fire, which would be a contradiction to that. A thought. That's why practice is so important. Self-preserving, in a sense, but without ego implications. And you can extend your life, because peace is worth having. So leave it to peace, and peace will try and maintain itself. Then you can get, take your life if you want at that level, and it's not going to matter because you are in peace. And you go in peace, you stay in peace. Continue. Well, this is just a comment that this seems to 
bring back the full theme of this book, which is a, a variety of, of techniques for, let's say, elevating oneself, uh, creating the possibility for transcendence, mm -hmm. uh, putting oneself in places other than uh, low energies or low spirits or negativity, uh, raising oneself up to put oneself, let's say, out of range as, as a byproduct. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yes. And, yes. And oh. so all this is going on. So there's there's a whole uh, wealth of uh, uh, techniques in, in all these statements that you're offering here. Absolutely. It's it's all about technology. Okay. It is that. It is insight technology. Every line has the power of insight technology in these books that I've rendered to you, and for the sake of others, no doubt about it. Just read for yourself and you see the power it has, the protection it offers, and so on and so forth. Yes, the vision it offers. Continue. Uh, this brings up another question related to words, and that is their source. Um, the, the same words that you say coming from another source may not have uh, the same value, would you agree? Absolutely. When you hear, I love you from one person, maybe one thing, when you hear from another person, or like from your mother, it may have a whole different value. Of course, it's relative to the being and where they're coming from. Always relative to the being where they're coming from. Everything relative to who and where it's coming from. Everything. How is it that we know that in, inside ourselves when, when we hear a source that has the wisdom behind the words, we hear a source that's mouthing the words, many people intuit the difference immediately. What, yes, so recognition is instantaneous in some cases, which proves the point that you're not who you are. Chronically speaking, you're deeper than that. So we have to see if we can find circumstances or a situation where we are able to be deeper than we have assumed ourselves or presumed, presume ourselves to be, in fact, that we are just karmic beings. We're boys and girls out there in the field of boys and girls. And, you know, we're here just to be vulnerable to each other as boys and girls and do what boys and girls do and all the rest of that. It's a very limited, very, very um, difficult situation to be in. You have to broaden your scope, and so you're not just this, you're not just that, you're an intelligence. What you really are is a mental being, not just a physical animal being, but you're a mental being, you're a heart being. So you have to exercise your right to be a heart being, as well as a, a peace being, as well as a light being, as well as a beauty being, as well as a wise being, as well as a free being, see? as well as a heart being, as well as a silent being, so on. We have a lot of levels of being to get to. Um, you make the comment in this book, perceive the need, conceive the creation, and receive its manifestation. This is the way of creating from spirit, creating in spirit, and creating as spirit. Um, other people have used things like this as a formula for material uh, attainment or success. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just wondering your comments on that. Um, in terms of what? Or maybe that may be the norm. Maybe the norm. You need the material as well as anything else. It's all material. Even your idea of spiritual is material to your your success. It's material. Your practice is material to your success. Right? So everything is material when you look at it from a certain viewpoint. I mean substantial. Material in terms of being significant, substantial. So having consequence. And so spiritual is material. If you know what it is and how, how to use it, and it is absolutely material. So, and we're not saying that's all it is, but certainly, you know, the spiritual is a force, depending on what you recognize it to be and how you use it. So you're moving towards the spiritual, so you're still using your forces, you're operating from the physical plane and the astral plane, the psychic plane. So you have to sense that the spiritual is more powerful and more real to you than just what your, your karmic experience is, and that's true. It's the only way you're going to get through that. Otherwise, you're just a prisoner in these programs that keep you isolated from it. And when you're around it and you find some kind of real spiritual presence, then you see that it melts down these, these barriers. It has a, a potential for melting down the barriers see, of materiality so that you start feeling the true presence and sweetness of the spiritual as a heart. Love and compassion as part of the heartness, heartfulness of life, master, and so on. So it's all material. Your practice is very material, in a sense. And we just, this is semantic uh, perception right now. It's all, all material. 
And the whole concept of transcendence is material, getting beyond what you perceive to be more real, and this is beyond that, so it's paradoxical. See? The transcendent, the burn, is very, very material. It's a physical, the tangible, real process. You feel it. So you, hear the, you hear the word and then you feel your mind dissolve. It's very real, it's very physical, very material. But then it's from a spiritual viewpoint in order to restore you to the true spiritual beyond the material, and that's what makes it a sacred process rather than anything less than that, something of a theoretical possibility alone. Go on. So does this practice uh, serve to, let's say, displace the material or, or help it find its proper place? I think the practice helps you to understand the material and what's beyond the material. The idea is to understand what is going on. So once you start to enter the level of understanding, whether it's by intuition or by reasoning, then you start to recognize what's at risk in terms of your mind, what's at risk in terms of your body, what's at risk in terms of your karma and the social being or career, What's at risk if you are in a certain kind of raggedy state of mind? And what's at risk you know, if you lose your life? And then uh, if you don't practice, what's at risk? Your whole life may be at risk, depending on who you are. Whereas spiritual practice can sometimes be like 2% of some person's life, and that could be a very critical 2% for them. Everything else would seem to be normal. They're acting the same, looking the same, being the same, talking the same, dancing the same, playing the same. Right? Loving the same, but then they have this 2% of, let's say, the, the field of transcendence, light. And that makes all the difference in the world for them. They know it, and they feel it. It's very powerful, and yet it's maybe just in the form of sitting, quietly. But it's extremely powerful, because in that moment they feel that they are the source and true, true center of the universe, which is crucial. You are that. Not as an ego, but as beingness. No doubt. Does denial or elimination of material uh, objects, possessions, whatever, lead to uh, spiritual development? It may or may not. Depends on the individual. You can have a lot of materiality, and that's what it will take for you to get you a spiritual. You may have no spirit, uh, materiality, and that might be what it takes for you to get to the spiritual. It's different for everyone. So these general formulas that uh, more or less uh, distract people into thinking there's some truth there, not true for everybody. There is no way for everybody that is the same. Everyone is their own way, and they've got to use various means, methods, techniques, or mentors to get to that point where they realize that their way beyond their suffering is the only way that they can be. See? The only way that they can get to what and who they need to be. Yeah. So the Master is here to put you properly in your way, on the path which is your way which is not your possessively speaking way, your possessive way, it is your true way, beyond possessiveness and beyond possession altogether. See, it's the true light way, right? the true heart way. Yeah. May the blessings be.